Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, special presentation. Uh, today is the first installment of our 2021 symposium on the Gilded Age. My name is Samuel Holliday, and I have the pleasure of working as the pres as the uh, director of operations and scholarship. Jane, uh, Jane, forgive me for the slip of the tongue there. The director of operations and scholarship for the United States Capitol Historical Society, and we're thrilled that so many of you have taken time out of your busy day to join us as we explore this important and fascinating history uh, of. Uh, the United States and how Congress has played a role. Before we get started with today's program, uh, talking about the political developments of the Gilded Age, uh, I'd like to go over a few technical housekeeping matters. Uh, we love you know, using this Zoom platform to engage with you, our audience, while we can't meet fully in person. Uh, and there are some ways that you can interact in today's program. If you have any content-based questions for today's presenters, today's distinguished scholars, uh, there will be Q&A at the end, and you can submit those questions through the Q&A section of the webinar. That looks like two speech bubbles, either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on what device you're using to join us today. If you have any technical troubleshooting matters, if you feel like you're having difficulty hearing us or seeing us during the course of today's presentation, you can put that into the chat section of the webinar. That looks like a single speech bubble, either at the top or bottom of your screen, and I will answer those troubleshooting matters in real time. So once again, any content-based questions for our wonderful scholars today can go into that Q&A section of the webinar. So now it is my great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, uh, to start today's program and introduce today's speakers. Jane. There we go. Thank you so much, Sam. Uh, and no worries. I, I, know, I, know, I know how well you do your job. And <laughs> thank you all for being with us today. Today, it's we start a set of, of seminars about the Gilded Age. Some would refer to it as the first Gilded Age, um, a time when the country was dealing with industrialization, when dealing with uh, our status as a nation. Um, and we have lots of issues that we want to bring forth. And one of the most Terrific things. Sorry, I missed starting my video, but you heard me. Um, so let me say one of the most terrific things about our virtual series is that we are able to bring to you speakers from all around the country and indeed all around the world. Today, we have three scholars, one who is joining us from Japan. Uh, if you can imagine. And each is going to talk about, in their own particular way, about how United States dealt during this period of time with immigration, with our changing engagement with Native Americans, and the rise of American imperialism. And we're going to do all that in an hour and give you a chance for Q&A. So let us start right away. I'm going to introduce all three of the speakers. They will turn it over one to another. And then uh, we will go to our traditional question period. As always, put your questions in the Q&A, and I will field them to our scholars, who we've also invited to question one another uh, as the conversation goes on. You will first hear from Hidetaka. Uh, Hidetaka Hirota is an associate professor in the Department of English Studies at Sophia University um, in Japan, where he teaches North American Studies and Migration Studies. He's a social and legal historian of U.S. immigration, specializing in the history of American nativism and immigration law and policy. He's the author of Expelling the Poor, American Seaboard States and the 19th Century Origins of American Immigration Policy, which won multiple book awards. And you will see that as you hear him talk. In the spring of 2022, he will start a new position as the Associate Professor of History at the University of California, Berkeley, moving a little closer uh, to us. Uh, Dr. Kate Bort York 
joined the Ham Hamline faculty in 2002. She will be talking with us about the changing relationship with Native Americans um, as the country was going through the Gilded Age. Um, Dr. Bork teaches courses in Latin American history, as well as courses about empires, borders, environmental history, and the history of disease. Interesting these days. Her most recent book, Prairie Imperialists, The Indian Country Origins of American Empire, examines the continuities in the expansion of the United States as an empire from the continental United North America to the overseas territories that came under the United States influence following the Spanish-Cuban-American War. Uh, Professor York earned her bachelor's from the University of California at Berkeley and her master's and PhD in Latin American history from the University of Chicago. And our final speaker is Paul McCartney. He will not be singing. Um, he will tell us how his parents came to believe that somehow the Beatles would be done and he could just be the memory. Dr. McCartney uh, earned his PhD from the University of Virginia in 2001, is an associate professor of political science, um, at, teaches in the master's program at, there at, uh, at, at, at his college, which at Towson, at Towson. Um, and before joining the faculty at Towson, he taught at Rutgers, the University of Richmond and Princeton. Um, he teaches and does his research in the fields of international relations, American foreign policy and American nationalism. He's the faculty director of the Towson University Journal of International Affairs and his publishing have been in many refereed journals. And he's most recently published a book called Power and Progress, American National Identity, The War of 1898, and the Rise of American Imperialism. So you can see Dr. McCartney will be well able to speak to us about how American imperialism emerged and was strengthened during the period of the Gilded Age. And so to get us started, we will turn to Professor Haroda. Hidetaka, take it away. Thank you for being with us. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, thank you. Um, right. What time is it where you are? It's actually 1 a.m. Um, so uh, thank yeah. you for staying awake late for us. I will I will step off so you can take the screen. Well, thank you. Um, all right, yeah. So um uh, thank you, um, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Um, here at, it's actually uh, you know past midnight anyway. But uh, um, before I start, I'd like to thank Jane and um, Sam for inviting me to to this symposium. Um, it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to talk about immigration policy in the Gilded Age. Um, over the course of the final decades of the 19th century, federal policy for restricting immigration to the U.S. emerged became institutionalized and expanded. So I'd like to start by explaining the context of the rise of federal immigration policy. So there were um, a few things that had laid a foundations for uh, the introduction of the uh, US immigration policy in this period. First of all, it is wrong to think that US had open borders before the Gilded Age. Since the early 19th century, immigration control was conducted uh, in the US at the local and state levels, if not by the national government. So for example, Northeastern states such as New York and Massachusetts restricted the landing of destitute Europeans like impoverished Irish immigrants. And California also attempted to restrict Chinese immigration since the age of gold rush. Then in 1875, in the case of Henderson versus May of New York, the US Supreme Court declared uh, these state passenger laws unconstitutional for violating the federal government's authority over foreign commerce. And this created momentum for the introduction of national immigration law, which would regulate immigration in place of existing state laws. Also, although slavery seems to have nothing to do with immigration policy, 
the abolition of slavery in fact paved the way for national immigration policy. So before the Civil War, Southern slaveholding states resisted the possible introduction of any federal policy that would intervene into states' rights to regulate the movement of people. Those Southern states feared that if the national government regulated foreign immigration and prohibited Northern states from doing immigration control with state laws, it could also invalidate uh, Southern states' laws for prohibiting the admission of free Blacks into the Southern states. This consideration prevented the, uh, the possible introduction of federal immigration policy before the Civil War. But after the abolition of slavery, uh, Southern congressmen lost reasons to resist federal immigration policy. This also helped the political settings for national policy. Now, if these were the pre, uh, preconditions for federal immigration policy uh, passed, uh, you know, uh, introduced in the Gilded Age, uh, there were some more direct causes for its introduction in the Gilded Age. And the most uh, important context is apparently the intense conflict between uh, labor and capital in this period. You know, as the U.S. Uh, went through the so-called the Second Industrial Revolution after the Civil War. American workers increasingly suffered the deterioration of their social and economic conditions, which provoked the uh, radical labor movement against industrial capitalism. And under those circumstances, American workers in California uh, criticized Chinese immigrants for working for low wages unacceptable to white people. And this economic critique of Chinese labor was aggravated by racial and cultural prejudice against Chinese. Uh, and these sentiments resulted in the anti-Chinese movement of the 1870s and calls for the suspension of Chinese immigration through national legislation. On the East Coast too, there was growing native sentiment against European immigrants, especially those from Southern and Eastern European countries, such as Italy. American workers complained that these immigrants were imported by capitalists as strike breakers or low wage workers to replace them. And here, let me just um, share a, a slide. So um, uh, these anti-immigrant sentiments in 1870s and 80s uh, led Congress to pass a series of laws to restrict immigration to the US. So I will not go into the detail of each legislation, but as you can see in this slide, during the Gilded Age, uh, the federal government moved to suspend the immigration of Chinese workers, and excluded diverse groups of people, including um, prostitutes, uh, the poor, mentally ill, criminals, contract workers, people likely to become public charges, and um, people uh, with contagious diseases. And, and uh, the, the category of uh, exclusion continued to expand in the early 20th century. The introduction of the federal laws was accompanied by the institutionalization of national immigration control. So as I said earlier, state governments administered immigration, but by the end of the 19th century, the Bureau of Immigration was established as a federal agency devoted to issues of immigration control. And immigration inspectors who were federal employees were assigned to points of entry to process the newcomers and uh, implement uh, immigration laws. The Immigration Act of 1893 uh, also established procedures for additional interrogation against foreigners whom officials found suspicious in the preliminary uh, inspection on arrival. I should say that um, early federal policy uh, met a number of failures, in fact, uh, suffering uh, a lot of things such as understaffing, insufficient fans, um, budget, motivation problems of inspectors, structural loopholes, and evasions by uh, immigrants themselves and Americans who wanted their labor. Nevertheless, US immigration control in later periods uh, was founded on legal and institutional frameworks set in the Gilded Age. So now I want to make a few uh, observations about early federal immigration control. What is the tension between restrictionism and pro-immigration sentiment in Congress? So restrictionist politicians, such as uh, those in California, actively demanded federal immigration control 
But immigration control um, was not always a universally popular policy in Congress. Republicans tended to value the economic benefit of immigration, whether they uh, liked, you know, sympathize with the Chinese or not. And um, Democrats uh, sympathized with the labor movement that was hostile to immigrant strike breakers, but they generally endorsed European immigration. The Foreign Act of 1885, which prohibited the importation of contract workers, illustrates this, this kind of ambivalence toward immigration. So to pass this law in Congress, promoters of this law emphasized that they had no intention of checking entire immigration to the US. Free and voluntary immigrants were welcome, they said, but the law only affected the, uh, uh, a particular group of immigrants, that is foreign workers imported by capitalists under prearranged contracts to work in the US and often as strike breakers. And in this way, uh, these policymakers try to meet demands for immigration control from organized labor without alienating uh, European immigrant voters in general. Second, I'd like to point to the centrality of the concept of police power in federal immigration laws. Police power is this idea that every community has an inherent right to protect itself against external threats whether they were uh, armed forces, diseases, economic competitions, cheap labor, or undesirable races. The concept was central to earlier state-level immigration policy against impoverished immigrants, and it was inherited by national laws to restrict the immigration of the poor, criminals, and those with contagious diseases. And the concept was integrated into racism and racism and um, served as the central principle of Chinese exclusion as well. So, so police power was a really uh, consistent force in the history of American immigration policy. Finally, um, I'd like to uh, emphasize the social implications of legislative immigration control in the Guild of Age. Immigration policy and racist native sentiments among ordinary Americans developed in tandem. So as, as the federal government developed immigration policy, white Americans attempted to remove Chinese from their communities through uh, private violence. Th thus the late 19th century uh, witnessed uh, numerous anti-Chinese riots, including Rock Springs massacre of 1885, 1885 in Wyoming, which led to the loss of at least 28 uh, Chinese lives. Also, um, Chinese exclusion laws forced many Chinese to seek an authorized admission to the US. As historians of uh, Chinese exclusion have demonstrated, this prompted white Americans to view all Chinese categorically as an unauthorized alien group. Thus, immigration policy directly shaped the perceptions of racial groups in American society. Okay. Um, I have other things to say, but I stop here. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. Um, I look forward to your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. <clears throat> uh, and now, Professor York, are you ready to pick it up? I am. Thank you, Jane, very much. And I have some slides to present here as well. Okay, can I just check and make sure people are able to see my, my title page here? We're ready to go. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I wanna start with the observation that I've altered the title a little bit here. And um, that is because uh, I want us to um, really recognize what it, that, that the people, that uh, the government in this case, I think we've well established that the relations that we're focusing on, of course, don't um, encompass all the variety and complexity of relations with native people, but that that relating by the government and, and by the entities that the government empowers to, um, to uh, uh, do be the mechanisms for the relationships and, the, and enacting the goals that the, the Congress establishes, are really um, identified as, as Indians with all of the um, 
racial baggage uh, and ideas um, of the time about relative civilization and progress and, and backwardness that, that the policies then were, were designed to address. So um, uh, that's um, one observation I'll make here at the beginning. Um, I've put up a couple of uh, really just points of reference um, that uh, serve to frame the, the period that I'm going to be talking about because Gilded Age can have a rather elastic kind of um, chronological meaning. And I want to emphasize particularly the importance and the, the sort of extension of an ideology, a, a mindset that is um, initiated by the work of this uh, US Indian Peace Commission that the Congress, Congress establishes in 1867, which um, is associated with the, the so-called peace policy, um, usually really uh, primarily associated with the Grant Administration, but its um, focus on uh, civilization, education, and significantly involving um, people identified as humanitarians, um, friends of the Indians, particularly uh, uh, Christian denominations in that, in uh, carrying out the, the goals for policy in this period. And finally, just notice the, the um, important material basis for this relationship, uh, the control and ownership of tribal lands that shrinks in this time. The larger political context for uh, Gilded Age relations with Indians is the uh, post-Civil War era of expansion um, and the various public-private initiatives that the Congress um, introduced, uh, which um, combined uh, incentives and the resources of the state with the, the private interest in um, moving west in homesteading and settling uh, towns and, and so on, and also in, uh, in building that significant uh, work of infrastructure, uh, several, not just one, transcontinental railroads, which had a tremendous effect um, uh, on encroaching on Indian lands. Uh, in 1870, the first railroad goes directly through Indian lands, as well as facilitating decimation of game. We particularly associate this with the, uh, you know, the, the ultimate and almost fatal decline of, of bison. And significantly, it also uh, made it easy to deploy troops um, uh, and to move the frontier uh, army. Um, now, when we consider uh, what changes in this period, I think it's also important to pay attention to um, you know, what, what stays the same or, or, or continuities from the past. And at the very top of this slide, I've outlined sort of the three modes, three of the modes, I think they're probably not exhaustive, that the United States has embraced across its history uh, in its relations with native nations. Um, one is sovereign relations, uh, most, uh, you know, uh, associated with treaty making, which sovereign states do with one another. The other is removal. And I debated whether to put a slash and put extermination there as another policy. And then the other policy of assimilation, assimilation of native people into the um, framework and the ideals and the values of the, the population as a whole. So this period I would broadly characterize as um, involving a shift away from the framework of government to government uh, relations. In 1871, the Congress decided that it no, one, no longer wanted to be involved with funding treaties that were being made and uh, it ceased its recognition of new treaties. We should say that uh, government contracts and compacts with native people continued. They didn't completely cease, but I think it says something about the, the framework. Um, there is continuity in this period with earlier uh, Indian re removal, and here I want to show you a slide from the colonial era on the, the left, and, and if you look at the, the writing on the map here that says lands reserved for the Indians. So there was back to colonial times this idea of separation um, uh, between uh, Indians and uh, European 
uh, settlers. That and on the right, of course, this is probably more what people associate with uh, removal. The the uh, infamous uh, Federal Indian Removal Act of 1830 and the, the removals of Cherokee, Chickasaw, Choctaw Creek people to uh, Indian territory. Um, but uh, the the overriding um, goal of uh, Indian policy in this period, I would say, was a focus on assimilation. Um, this was an assault on cultural autonomy and tribal identity. Its mechanisms were promoting education. Uh, probably the person most associated with this uh, movement is Colonel uh, uh, Richard Pratt, who was the founder of the Carlisle Indian Industrial School and is uh, famous for this statement, kill the Indian, save the man. Um, but this was a much more extensive um, effort. Uh, and um, on top of that, uh, the effort to uh, as assimilate people to um, the economic habits and values and to also break up uh, reservations, which was significantly um, advanced by the passage of the Dawes Severalty Act, the Allotment Act in 1887, and you can see the impact it had on alienating land from tribes and turning it over to the public domain and into private ownership, most of it not in Native hands. Um, the Western historian Robert Utley has observed that military policy was the iron hand in the velvet glove of the peace policy with all of its emphasis on humanitarian, bringing Indians along, integrating them into the, into the, the nation culturally. Um, and I will point out here that uh, in 1894, US Census report uh, accounted 800 million that had been spent on military actions against indigenous people since independence. Uh, accepting the Civil War, War of 1812, and the Mexican-American War, these uh, expenditures represent three quarters of US military spending in this period. So this is an, a significant uh, part of the way that the United States related to Native peoples. And the best use I think you can make of this map, which has all kinds of complex information like forts and posts and peoples, is just kind of squint a bit and you get a kind of impression of the contested areas uh, where the United States engaged a native people, especially in the, in the Great Plains, as they tried to push forward all those mechanisms for the things we call expansion and, and um, uh, homesteading and, and the railroads and, and so on. Um, so uh, finally, I will end with uh, this slide. Um, which uh, shows a, a representation um, done by Black Horse and other Cheyenne warriors uh, in the period of what is called the Great Sioux War um, that depicts a raid on a Cheyenne camp on the Powder River. And I'm throwing this in at the end as just a, a very um, uh, meager recognition that uh, relations involve uh, both sides and this is um, just a little bit of a perspective of, you know, the, the, the other side of, of uh, people involved in this process of, of relating across the, the Gilded Age. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor York. You're certainly given us lots to think about. Now, Dr. McCartney, uh, put us, take us to the next level. Hi everyone. Um, all that the, I guess the next level means is that uh, a lot of what uh, I'm going to talk about in the emergence of the United States as an imperial power as classically understood um, was touched on and developed already um, by the first two presentations. Uh, what I'm interested in, in helping us understand are how ideas shape foreign policy and how foreign policy shapes national identity uh, in a sort of co-constitutive manner. And the four I, sets of ideas, I guess categories of ideas that I find to be um, especially important for this era are race, religion, 
uh, liberal democratic values and tying them together, evolutionary concepts. Um, there was a sense of progress, a sense of forward motion, um, a sense of hierarchy and that some folks are um, more suited to lead than others. And, and a lot of the, the, the themes that were touched on in the first two presentations really um, explained well. Um, there was a mood in this time that the United States did not have the status it deserved. That the United States at the founding had um, understood itself to be uh, you know, the, the future, the vanguard of mankind, the, uh, uh, not just a nation state, but uh, a community of world historical significance with a mission, a transformative mission. Uh, and it was sort of rankling a little bit that the United States was treated still as something of a second rate power. And it was a belief that the United States was in fact better than everyone else. And it was pretty much it was time for the United States to assume its um, seat at the table of, of the great powers and really assume leadership. And Woodrow Wilson kind of you know, took us to that stage um, in a halting way, only, only 20 years later. And he, and he was very enthusiastic about, about a lot of um, what happened in the Spanish-American War and the Philippine-American War and the, you know, and the consequences thereof. Um, but the first thing I really want to highlight is that all of the ideas were contested, all of the uh, significance was contested. There was, there's no, you know, simple causal connection between ideas uh, and policies. Um, and I'll, I'll just use uh, evolution and Darwinism as the example because I think it captures things most clearly. Um, no, the evolutionary theory tied things together in a sense that first, it, as regards um, religion, there were some millennial um, developments in biblical modernism that became prominent in this time that um, you know, spurred a, a fundamentalist backlash ultimately, but led um, American Christians to, to um, who were most of those in power and certainly defining the culture um, that there were chosen nations and God used nations as hand vessels for his purposes and will and uh, ministers would preach this from the pulpit and um, pious members of, of Congress would sincerely, it seems, ad adhere to these beliefs. Um, there were racial hierarchies that were, you know, the, the field of anthropology emerged in this time uh, with explicit racial hierarchies, Anglo-Saxon on top, two, number two, and so on. And um, the, the, one could argue that the Spanish-American War in part developed because Spain, which was pretty low on that hierarchy because nations were defined in racial ethnic terms, um, as it was a, the Spanish character, which had religious connotations as, and um, political structures like monarchy were believed to be in some part expressions of the inherent characteristics of races, but Spain was doing things to Cuba 90 miles from America that Americans didn't like, and how could we just sit here and let that happen? Um, so there was a sense that we had to do something. Um, now, evolution, the idea that you know, the best kind of went out and rise to the top, informed the belief that it was time for the US to take control in leadership, but when after the war ended and the peace treaty um, very consciously gave the Philippines to the United States, um, some social Darwinist thinkers like William Graham Sumner uh, had interpreted social Darwinism to be anti-statism and they immediately recognized the statist requirements of a colonial policy. And so they opposed imperialism. They said that this will, you know, pull us down. And, and in order to implement this policy, we have to change what made us great in the first place, and this will be a step back. Other evolutionary theorists had a kind of collective understanding of uh, Darwinian progress, like Brooks Adams. And they, um, thinkers of this ilk, said it was a Darwinian competition between states. Um, and states that don't keep advancing uh, 
fall behind. And you get a rise of civilization, you know, rising and falling. Um, and if we didn't, then others would, if we didn't take the Philippines, someone else would, we just keep falling behind. Um, and, I, and I highlight this because the idea of Darwinism doesn't lead to um, embracing colonialism or opposing it, but depending on how it's interpreted and applied could lead to either position. Same with race, for example. Um, on the one hand, it was Rudyard Kipling's uh, idea of white man's burden, that whites need to uplift and civilize uh, those who are not white and you know, help them achieve what they can achieve, which was not gonna be as good as what whites can, but it was sort of a moral duty to, to do it. The most virulent opponents of uh, imperialism were the most racist. They were, you know, the, uh, some of the speeches that were read on the floor of the Senate and the House were it, it kind of stunning uh, to modern ears in what they would claim is that, you know, you, you know, and I, I still don't know if this speech was serious, but um, I can't remember the name of the, of the representative, but said there were striped people in the Philippines. So, you know, striped people. Um, there was a belief we had to Christianize the Philippines, even though they were Catholic. Um, so these ideas didn't make the policies happen, um, but what they did is they prepared Americans to pursue the policies that they did when presented with the contingencies that Spain presented them with. The first, as I uh, noted, was what it was doing in Cuba. And to be sure there were economic interests that drove the United States. Um, whether the, the US would have intervened in the Cuban nationalist revolt that was taking place against Spain in the 1890s and had been sort of a recurring theme throughout the 19th century is uh, an open question. But for sure, there was a lot of um, sincere revulsion after the, the Spanish government started using concentration camps. Um, and one of the signature moments giving rise to the decision to intervene, in addition to the main, we all know the main, remember the main to hell with Spain, uh, was a speech by Senator Redfield Proctor of, of Vermont, uh, who was known to be a sober, non-hysterical skeptic of a lot of the reports. And he, along with lots of other senators and members of Congress at various points went on fact-finding missions to see what was going on. And he gave a very uh, detailed accounting of atrocities. And after he was done, it was sort of understood that, okay, we can't just do nothing. We, we, we have an obligation to act because that's what great powers do when it's time to replace Spanish backwardness and monarchy with American greatness. Um, and, and this is a continuity, and, and um, you know, as, as Professor Bjork talked about, the, the, the continental U.S. is a product of this the same kind of imperial mindset. There's it's really little difference. The same ideas were there. There was the, the Darwinian overlay was certainly more pronounced in the 1890s than before, but it was sort of implicit in some ways. Um, and the race and the religion was there. The, and those were foreign policies. I think that was one of the, I mean, on that, that last map, there were a lot of battle sites, battles, and it wasn't a civil war. These, these were battles, um, which is a sort of interesting way to conceive of, of the country as, a, as a, an arena for foreign policy. But what made the imperialism after the War of 1898 distinctive is that the lands that were taken from Spain, Puerto Rico, um, in the Philippines in particular, Cuba had the Teller Amendment attached and that was because some populist uh, members of Congress insisted on attaching it so that we wouldn't take Cuba because they suspected that was the ambition of, of some of the um, more eager interventionists. Um, so Cuba wasn't part, but with the, the Philippines and Puerto Rico, there was never an illusion that they were going to be fitted to become states. Uh, and that's, and that's a, was, a really interesting development. I mean, all of the um, the westward expansion previously, the idea was that once the right population is in place and the right values are in place and with a sufficiently large center of gravity, then we can admit them to statehood. 
it was understood from the beginning the Philippines and Puerto Rico were not going to become states. It, it wasn't going to happen, and largely because of the population, their their racial component above all, but also um, religion. But the, the, we were going to Christianize them. Um, but race was, was one of the big ones, and it was also distance and logistics and so forth. So this was a, 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 a pursuit of an imperial policy on the idea that we're becoming an imperial power in a way that we hadn't liked to think of ourselves before and, and that we had sort of denied. And it led to a massive debate. And I highlighted in the, the Darwinism talk an example of how William Graham Sumner and Brooks Adams, for example, presented different interpretations. And, and this was a very robust debate and it cut across party lines. It was um, very passionately engaged around the country. Um, and just, you know, just as a quick step aside about myself, I'm a political scientist, not an historian. And when I started studying this, I'd had no intention on making it my focus. It was going to be one um, of a case study, but the debates were so rich, so involved, um, very profound. Like, who are we as a country? Like, how can we be a country founded on the Declaration of Independence and consciously assume colonies? I mean, that was sort of an anti-colonial document. And the sorts of arguments that were um, concocted and, and engaged on either side um, quite often said, well, if we're going to do this, and we should, it means that we're going to become a different kind of country and a better kind of country. We're going to assume our birthright, as it were. And so with good reason, a lot of um, studies of American foreign policy see this as a turning point. You know, all those like at World War II, you could pick and choose, but certainly it was, it was a major pivot in how the United States conceptualized its role in the world. And it did so because of all these ideas floating around about who the, the U.S. was among the policymakers in particular encountered a set of contingencies. First, we'll call it Spanish misbehavior in their eyes. And second, we got these Philippines. Afterwards, in, in the midst of the great power competition of, of colonies, um, that forced these ideas to be applied in ways um, with new and deeper significance. Um, and one thing I like about studying this era is that I, I feel like they were a lot more honest than some subsequent debates have been. They, they're very straightforward. If, if they were going to be racist, they just said racist stuff. They said, we're going to Christianize. Now there's a lot of coded speak and trying to pretend we're not doing what we're doing, but um, they, they, they were unvarnished back then, which made the debates pretty clear. Um, and I'll stop there uh, because I don't want to talk too long. So thank you. Wow, we've got a lot to think, uh, to think and talk about. So we invite all of our presenters to come back on the camera. Um, and we're going to see if we can do a lightning rod because we've We've got so much information and so many uh, gifts. So let me quickly say, we've got several of our folks have asked about, as you looked at some of the issues that were raised about removal, uh, assimilation as part of the expansion, that was part of, can Canadian expansion, it was part of the Australian experience. Was that part of the British Empire's experience as well? Um, who wants to take? Uh, I, I don't want to take that. I'd like to defer to someone else about the British Empire, but I would comment about the Spanish and French empires. And I, I think we can broadly see the, these same impetuses in different ratios, uh, different um, measures at different times. But there's quite a difference in the uh, attitude of the French and the, the um, Spanish, uh, really, well, the Spanish especially wanting to uh, inter integrate and make use of the labor of the, the indigenous people in, in Mexico, for example, and in the rest of, of that empire. So um, there isn't the, the pushing away, um, there, there's actually policy that affirms the uh, humanity and the desirability of marriages. And uh, not to say that there isn't a lot of that hierarchical 
uh, racist um, uh, ideology going on as well that, that Professor McCartney talked about. But um, there's not sort of the creation of lands reserved for the, the Indians. Well, actually, not strictly true, but uh, in, a, in a different way. And I'll let others comment. Anybody have a uh, statement on Africa or should we move to the next? Well, the other thing I'll add is that all the countries in question had the, had a, their own version of the idea of a civilizing mission. So there was a sense that they were chosen to uplift whoever it is that they were conquering. So and, and that's what the US was competing with. And I'll stop. And the other, I think, important thing that each of you talked about is it was a time in history where the United States was trying to assert its world leadership. Yeah. It was not, you know, we now think of the United States as the leader of the world or a world leader at the very least. That was not the case then. One of the questions uh, someone has asked is, um, and I think maybe uh, Professor Hirota will we, we'll go to you for this one, that you spoke very, eloquently about the Asian American uh, immigration and the uh, Chinese exclusion and whatnot. Um, at the same time, there was going on on the East Coast of this country, a real concern about white working class people who were coming in uh, and trying to limit the immigration in that area. Can you speak to that at all? I'll, I'll Thank you. First of all, um, I was reading the final, the last question, the the, the, uh, the latest question. Um, um, it's it's so. Um, I, I said in my in the um, presentation that um, there there was growing concern about immigration from eastern and uh, southern. I'm sorry, the uh, southern and eastern European countries such as Italy. But in fact, um, uh, numerically speaking. Um, uh, more immigrants are still coming from uh, Western and Northern European countries than uh, Southern and Eastern European countries. So numerically speaking, uh, English um, were uh, the main immigrant group. Uh, and also basically the people from the British Isles uh, remained a kind of dominant immigrant group. But, but, but um, American workers and also those immigrants themselves um, uh, really feared that the uh, the feared increasing uh, immigration from uh, eastern and uh, from from west from from eastern and southern European countries. So uh, those in, uh, English immigrants, Irish immigrants, or American workers um, feared that. Uh, so, for example, Italians, uh, Hungarians, uh, they were arriving uh, in, in great numbers to 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 wipe out their employment. Um, so, um, so, so it, it's interesting to, um, to see those uh, uh, kind of traditional, old, you know, old stock immigrants and you know Americans' response because you know after all the number is not all that. Um, you know, surprise, you know, all, the, all that much actually. Uh, and then, you know, um, if, if I go back to the West Coast, um, Chinese immigration was so small proportionally, you know, they only accounted for like less than 5% of the entire immigration to the US. But nevertheless, uh, the response was a huge and national level. But anyway, so um, I think that, you know, people's perception is really uh, interesting to observe uh, if, if, if in light of the, in, in light of, of, of those numerical realities. Well, and you had also indicated that uh, the first question that someone put up about Vanderbilt showed his will to take care of his workers who were building Biltmore at providing housing, education, Carnegie created libraries. Did other gilded era barons show similar concern with investments for the people who were working and society in general? So I apologize about this, but uh, I, I meant to respond to the, the, the one below uh, about oh, the, okay. the railroad. And then I mistakenly, you know, uh, uh, typed the answer live. So um, um, technology is please, lovely. Yeah, you, know, yeah, please you, you, can, you can switch uh, it up. Uh, uh, but yeah, very briefly, you know, the trans, um, so the uh, rail companies were uh, the major opposition force 
against immigration restriction. So uh, they, they oppose, generally speaking, uh, federal, the introduction and expansion of federal immigration policy. And in fact, uh, those uh, railroad companies uh, uh, employed Chinese labor contractors. And those Chinese labor contractors uh, you know, had connections uh, with, with China and then they, you know, uh, they arranged uh, all the importation of Chinese workers for uh, the ro uh, railroad railroad construction. So, um, yeah, so you know, merchants, industrialists, and then um, those railroad companies were the kind of major uh, uh, entities against the forces against uh, regulatory immigration policy. So, yeah, let's take another one, uh, and maybe we go, Dr. York, to you. Um, how do you, of the three positions you sort of outlined, you know, removal, assimilation, um, what, which, which were the strongest? Um, and did any of these, were they presented in a way to propel the American economy? Or do you have a, would you like to tie it back to the economics of the society? I will try. I think um, removal was definitely tied to a, a vision for the expansion of the economy. I am a little concerned to um, think about any of the policies, you know, primarily in those terms. Um, and I also want to say again that I, I see these as uh, you know, uh, informing goals that overlapped and shifted in emphasis across time and, and going all the way back to, you know, the very earliest relations with, with uh, you know, uh, English uh, colonists showing up. So it's not a very definitive answer, but uh, I think that's the best I can offer on that question. Dr. McCartney, you, you kind of are nodding your head. Is that because you have something to say? Um, I'm just agreeing that these ideas, they all kind of fit together. They, um, you know, there are some things that are just clearly a Christian motivation, some clearly a racial motivation, but they all sort of work in tandem with each other um, and, and across policy realms. And they typically corresponded with economic interests. Um, so, for example, there was a lot of opposition by labor leaders to acquiring the Philippines because of the competition from uh, the Filipino laborers that they envisioned. And but the arguments were framed in very racist ways that, you know, well, they could work for 20 hours and not eat anything. And how could we compete? And they'll take it you know, so They all everything kind of fit together. And um, it's hard to disentangle the cause. So I, I was not in, in, in agreement to. One of the things someone brought up, and I think it was during your talk, is how did Hawaii, which no. did become a state, fit into yeah. the debate about Puerto Rico, which didn't become a state, yeah. and the Philippines, which you assert was never intended to become a state? Well, the, it, it was acquired at the same time by, from a very different trajectory. It was not part of the Spanish empire. The others were, and we conquered Spain and you know we, we took the Philippines in five hours until of course we then had the Philippine American War. Hawaii was a separate matter. It was um, settled by um, the doles, <laughs> basically the, the pineapple people, uh, and they made it, it. It was Hawaii was a lot more like Texas, um, where it was whites going and taking over an area and sort of doing the conquest on their own in a private way um, that was not the U.S. government. And then after they had done it in a way that the, you know, the white front and the U.S. government were okay with, they accepted Hawaii joining it. It just happened to be taking place at the same time. Um, and it, 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 in all likelihood, if the, you know, the, the War of 1898 didn't coincide in time. So all these ideas were being debated very explicitly. It may not have happened then. It may have waited a little bit more of the, the formal acquisition, but it was a different path to arrive there. That, that's the difference. Well, I would also say that the um, proposition for the interest political pursuit of annexation for Hawaii also predated the Spanish-American yeah. War, just as annexation of of Cuba 
you know, yeah. goes, goes all the way back to, all the way back to, to Jefferson. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, it's very important, your, uh, Professor McCartney, your comments about the foundation of uh, religious kind of civilization. So, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the planters uh, that intermarried with the Hawaiian aristocracy and then fomented a, a revolution to overthrow and install a pro-U.S. Uh, government in 1893, um, you know, that was a, a Protestant, basically New England congregational kind of uh, a, approach and already sort of in, in, installed there. And it had to be, that's the thing for as far as he was going, it had to be Christian. I mean, it didn't count as being civilized unless it was Christian, the right kind of Christian at that. So. The, uh, I'm sorry, if I, can, if I can jump in, the this imperial yes. framework uh, fits interestingly to the story of American uh, immigration policy as yeah. well. So the, um, in Hawaii, you know, it, you know, when 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 it was part of the United States, uh, U.S. immigration law was you know extended to to Hawaii. So the earlier you know Hawaiian planters enjoyed you know kind of like this labor imported from Japan and China, but then uh, when it when, when Hawaii became part of the U.S., uh, that that kind of importation um, was, was no longer possible uh, due to the uh, exclusion laws. So what happened is uh, it, you know those planters um, planned the importation of labor from Puerto Rico and, um, and the Philippines. Those Puerto Ricans, the Filipinos, F Filipinos, you know, they were like uh, U.S. nationals um, so that they have the freedom of movement, you know, in principle. So, so the, uh, their importation, you know, you know, would have nothing, nothing to do with immigration policy. So there, there was actually a, a scheme I mean, it, the scheme was implemented. Um, uh, to to export and transport those uh, workers to to Hawaii to replace to uh, sub supplement um, Japanese and um, Chinese workers in Hawaii, but I think this is how the imperial framework was kind of used um, to to secure labor, and then this is how this demand for labor and uh, the nativist sentiment uh, uh, were kind of compromised. Well, I'll tell you what, we could take this for another hour, but we promised you a brief, a brief conversation. So let me say for the questioner who asked about Vanderbilt and Carnegie and the investment in sort of philanthropic and care for their workers, we will get to that conversation as we talk about some of the key industrialists in during the course of this series. So come back, stay tuned. We'll, we'll get to that question. Uh, with different, different scholars, but nevertheless, everyone will provide their opinion. So we're gonna give you last word and try in the last word to put in something about this final question. The last word is, what do you want people to know about the Gilded Age from the perspective of your scholarship? And is there anything that you would add about how the media of the day influenced the development of foreign policy, the belief in foreign policy, the role of immigration. What do you want people to know about how the media played out, played out then with the policies that you describe? So we started with Dr. Hirota. So why don't we give you, that way we'll switch up the order and you can give us your closing remarks. Yeah, well, you know, um, media definitely played a huge role uh, in in um, promoting immigration restriction in, in Gilded Age. And, and in fact, you know, Gilded Age is a prime time for political cartoons. And if you look at, you know, late 19th century uh, newspapers, uh, you know, places like uh, uh, San Francisco, for example, you will see a lot of uh, anti-Asian uh, cartoons and also even in, in the East Coast, you know, Thomas Nuss cartoons or, you know, Harper's Weekly cartoons. And those cartoons really exaggerated racial, cultural traits of immigrants and also uh, the economic racial undesirability of those immigrants. And so uh, one of the one, one dominant theme in those political cartoons is to describe uh, immigrants as um, 
economic threats. So, uh, so no, you know, uh, Chinese coming in numbers, Japanese coming in numbers, and then those pauper workers uh, coming in numbers from Europe, and then they all took away um, uh, uh, Americans' employment, you know, like bread, uh, houses, there's these kind of things. So um, media uh, played a huge role in, in really uh, provoking uh, anti-immigrant sentiment, which was translated into immigration policy. Fabulous. Uh, all right, Dr. Bo Dr. York. You know, I think I would want more time to think about that, but I'm actually my first uh, reaction is the um, the barriers to information. I'm thinking about the fact that the defeat at the Battle of Little Bighorn in, in uh, 1876 took two weeks to reach the East Coast. And so I think my you know, and, and that's early in the period that we're talking about, but I'm thinking about actually uh, in the, the remoteness uh, and the, the, the barriers to, to knowledge, to firsthand knowledge, and the importance of the, the intermediaries that the government had empowered to inform and communicate, who were um, missionaries, but also significantly uh, army personnel who, who really shaped that that discourse even before it got to the journalists. So I think that's where I would look to explore that question. Fascinating. Dr. McCartney, the last word goes to you. Well, the, for the uh, War of 1890, everyone knows the yellow press. That's uh, for a while that was uh, believed to be the reason the U.S. attacked Spain along with the main. Uh, and there's, there's something to it. There was, you know, the papers by Pulitzer, for example, like in Hearst, really were pushing for war and, and so on. But I, 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 I wouldn't say that they caused the war, but they certainly tapped into a lot of the ideas that, um, that I described and that, that um, everyone here described and manipulated them to make war with Spain seem like a good idea and had a necessary duty almost. But the press was partisan at the time and so th there was not a uniform message being sent out and there wasn't a uniform message being received either. Um, and then one thing that I, I wanted to mention, so the very last thing I'll say is one important part of this period is for foreign policy particularly, but I think more generally is that this was seen and consciously and foreign policy was consciously used by the McKinley administration to overcome the civil war. It was a, a reconstruction of whiteness. So the people like Irish who were not seen as really white became white and Confederate generals were appointed to leadership positions. So it was seen as an effort to, re, to reunify the country on white, according to whiteness and which reinforced a lot of the other things because you had to pick and choose well, what are gonna be the bases of, of reuniting. And the yellow press tried to tap into some of that just to finish the West. So, Wow. Thanks. Well, thank you each for making the time to be with us. Uh, Dr. Hirota, I hope you get to go to sleep now. <laughs> um, uh, we really appreciate you being with us uh, and we're wiser for having listened to you. Uh, this is the first of our series um, in our symposium to understand the Gilded Age. And this will continue as you can see on your screen now uh, we're going to be talking about political developments of the Gilded Age starting next week, economic changes, the 26th, the disparate economic impacts, how the economic changes were very different for different uh, people in different positions. Um, a look at American arts and culture that emerged during the Gilded Age. Um, and then we have a special thing, we step outside the Gilded Age, um, where we have a book talk on November 18th with Robert Watson on George Washington's final battle. Um, as always, we, we take a special moment when someone writes a book that is of historical significance, particularly one that identifies issues related to congressional history, capital history, and we want to try to bring those to you so that you can be alerted to new things. As we move forward through November, we'll be working on some additional 
additional resources. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for your support. And we want to remind you as always, this is my PBS moment, uh, that we are a nonprofit organization. We do not receive an appropriation from Congress. Our work is available only because of the contributions. Each of our speakers today gave us the contribution of the gift of their time and their talent. And so we thank you all for that. We thank you for your contributions and we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care, be well, goodbye.